All right, guys, let's look at lesson three, which talks about nuclear fission versus fusion. So first we need to identify what artificial transmutation is. Artificial transmutation involves a high-speed particle that bombards a nucleus. This occurs in a particle accelerator. So this means that you're going to have a nucleus that's going to get hit by some particle that's moving at very fast speeds. So when we look at the difference between artificial and natural transmutation, artificial transmutation is always going to have two reactants. The reactants are the things that are on the left side of your arrow sign in an equation. So in this artificial example, we have one reactant, two reactants. The aluminum nucleus is one reactant and the helium nucleus, nucleus is the other one. That's how we know that this is artificial transmutation. Natural transmutation, on the other hand, only has one reactant. So when we look at this reaction example, we only have one thing on the left of our arrow, so that means we only have one reactant. If you add the actual masses of all the protons, neutrons, and electrons in an atom and compare it to the actual atom's mass, mass is lost. This is known as mass deficient. The mass is not officially lost, though, because we do have the law of conservation of mass that says mass cannot be created nor destroyed. It'll just change forms. So in these equations, our mass is not lost. The mass is converted actually into energy. The energy holds the subatomic particles together. It's called the binding energy. That's what's going to hold your protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. That's your binding energy. When these reactions occur, when these artificial transmutation reactions occur, small amounts of mass can be created into large amounts, large amounts of energy. That's where we can get very destructive when we use nuclear power in nuclear weapons. This energy can be harvested in fission and fusion reactors for everyday use for energy. So this is a fission reaction. So we have a neutron that hits this uranium-235 nucleus and it's going to split the uranium nucleus into a strontium nucleus and a xenon nucleus. When this happens, a lot of energy is released because you are hitting this nucleus with a lot of, uh, with, in a particle accelerator. So that particle, that neutron that's hitting that uranium nucleus has a lot of energy because it's moving extremely fast. It's going to cause the binding energy in the nucleus to break, which is going to break the nucleus into two smaller nuclei. A neutron is shot at a radioactive source which splits, producing a large amount of energy. So if the number of neutrons released is not controlled, a chain reaction will occur. And this type of reaction is used in nuclear bombs. So this uranium-235 split into two nucleus, but then when it split into the two nucleus, these three neutrons were, la were released as well. So they hit two more uranium-235s, and those nuclei split, and then neutrons were released. And that's a chain reaction. So all these particles are going to be bumping into each other in a small confined space, and that's how we get the reaction in a nuclear bomb. Like... Fat Man and Little Boy, which were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. The energy is also produced in the above nuclear reaction. So this is how we get our large explosions that completely devastate areas when we drop nuclear bombs on civilization. Fission reactors work a little bit differently. The reaction's energy is converted into steam, which turns the turbine system, which will create electrical energy from nuclear energy. So here is what the inside of a nuclear pump would look like. So we have an electric generator, we have our steam turbine, we have our pump. Our reactor core, this is where the nuclear reaction is happening, which will release energy, which will heat the steam, which will turn the turbine, causing energy, and it's a circular effect. Now, these types of buildings are really, really, really large, and they have to be filled with lots of concrete to try and protect all the excess nuclear radiation from getting out. So what happens is the fuel rods contain the fissionable radi radioactive source. Those, so these are the fuel rods that have that radioactive source. The control rods will regulate the neutrons that are absorbed. So that prevents the chain reaction from happening. So when these fuel rods, when the fission happens and the nuclei split, 
Remember, sometimes extra neutrons are released as well. The control rods will absorb those neutrons and prevent chain reactions from happening, which is what produces the large amounts of energy. The cooling fluid acts as a moderator and will slow these neutrons down. And that is what is in this whole circulating device. So a lot of the time it'll be colder water or something like that that will slow those neutrons down so they don't move fast and hit into other stuff at high speeds which will cause other nuclei to split. Nuclear power in America is about 20% electricity generated by nuclear fission. So imagine, this could eventually lead to nuclear power cars, fuel, which would be pencil sized, use cylinders, energy, so a thousand uh, units of energy would happen in 20 gallon tanks of gasoline, refuel every thousand weeks, so about 20 years if you had that much energy. The other type of reaction that happens is, is a fusion reaction. This involves the combining of nuclei to produce heavier ones. So two smaller nuclei will come together, release energy, and form one larger nucleus. Um, so for example, when you have a deuterium and a tritium coming together, you can produce a helium atom with an extra neutron. neutron excuse me. Hydrogen atoms combine to form helium in a star. So this is how stars are made. And this is what's happening in our sun as we speak. Uh, smaller hydrogen atoms are hitting each other and fusing together to make helium. Once all the, hel all the hydrogens used up, then the heliums will start banging together, making larger elements. And that's how the life of a star happens, like you've talked about in previous classes before. So how do we know that the sun is made up of helium? So if we were to observe the helium's bright light spectrum from the star, and we're going to talk about this more in detail when we talk about electrons in the next unit, the bright line spectrum from the sun is very specific. It's its fingerprint. So when we look at a helium's bright line spectrum from the sun, we can see all of these lines. All of these lines happen at certain wavelengths because they're all different colors, and that's how we know that the sun is made up of helium. So when we talk about fusion reactions, we have advantages and disadvantages like we do with everything. Fusion reactions, the advantages are they produce more energy, the materials are more readily available, they produce less waste, and they're less dangerous because the chain reaction doesn't happen. Once those two smaller nuclei fuse together, they're done. Um, it's not like they're going to keep fusing together. Um, the only problem with fusion reactions is that it's really expensive. It's really expensive and that's a big disadvantage is for using fusion reactions to produce power. So let's look at a practice problem. Which one of these uh, following equations represents artificial transmutation? So remember, artificial transmutation and natural transmutations are the two types. So pause the video and unpause when you're ready. Great, well welcome back. What did you come up with? You should have answered that number two is an artificial transmutation. And how do we know it's artificial? It's artificial because we have two reactants, two things on the left hand side of our arrow coming together to make something. That's how we know it's artificial transmutation. Now let's look at this, check your understanding. Which reaction illustrates a fusion reaction? We're going to go over the answer to this tomorrow in class. Have a good day.